a friend of mine, he was in the chow line getting food, and somebody cut in front of him, a sergeant that was over, over him in rank. And two minutes later, the guy was shot by a sniper and he was killed. And Cal wasn't, because he was in back of this guy now. Well, fate, I guess. In the morning, one day, uh, we lost the, uh, the, the platoon leader from the second platoon. They hit his side of the perimeter and, and, and he was killed that day. Um, luckily, he was in a hammock. I don't know, I had a hammock too, but I usually slept on the ground. Um, he was in the hammock and so he was, that was his mistake. I didn't have a lot of leisure time. It was either looking for trouble or sleeping. And I didn't sleep very well. Philip Skip McDonald was born in Rockford, Illinois, in 1944. He was the oldest of five children and considered his family to be very close. McDonald had the same opinion of Rockford as a whole in the 1940s and 50s. Rockford, I mean, I guess you say, hear, hear things about the good old days, but it was a lot closer community. There weren't anywhere near the problems we have today. It was an industrial community. Uh, my father owned a, actually a company was started by my grandfather and my father was the president of the company after he got back from the Second World War. But when I, I mean Harlem Lutheran High School was uh, the Runquist farm and where we live now was the Pepper farm and Riverside Boulevard was called Collins Road at the time, it wasn't Riverside. And I went to Marsh School, which was a run, one, two-room schoolhouse and 50 students. And it was on Springbrook Road, right down the road here. And we had first and second grade in one room and third through eighth in the other room. Very good childhood as far as I'm concerned. I had good education. I was, had a Rockford school system, which I think was a good system. As I said, I graduated from Auburn in the first graduating class. Um, there were all kinds of kids from Auburn because we had kids from Caledonia and Argyle because, as I said, Guilford wasn't built. We had kids from the west side, from the east side, and we all seemed to get along fine. I was a fairly good student, I think. I was a National Honor junior year, went to college, and I don't know anything else about my childhood. I don't know if there's anything else I can really tell you. I, uh, Applied to two different colleges when I got out of high school and accepted at both and never applied to anything else. But I went to the University of Colorado and at 17 years old, you don't go that far away from home. That was an error on my part. But I did finally graduate from the University of Denver. So I have a degree in marketing, BSBA with a major in marketing. I always tell people I was on the five-year plan. I redshirted myself for a year because it took me until 67 to graduate from college. While McDonald attended high school and college, America's role in the Vietnam War began to escalate. After the Gulf of Tonkin incident in 1964, the number of Americans in Vietnam grew rapidly. Tensions rose on the home front. Many did not understand why the United States was at war in Vietnam. McDonald would soon discover firsthand the harsh realities of the Vietnam War.
Well, as I said, I had a 2S deferment, which today is, doesn't mean anything. I guess you understand what it is though, right? You're a student, it's a student deferment. As long as you stayed in school, they couldn't draft you. If you flunked out of school or dropped out of school, then you became 1A and you were draft eligible. When I graduated from college, I immediately became 1A. Uh, I graduated in August of 67, and I was drafted in April of 68. I couldn't find a job because nobody wanted to hire me, even though I had a college education, because if you're 1A, they knew that you were going to be taken. And the chances are you'd go to Vietnam. I mean, probably one out of, or nine out of every ten. Uh, when I went into the induction center in Chicago, I used to have a train in Rockford that went into Chicago. They don't have that anymore. Um, they had a line you lined up, and there was a big Marine sergeant standing there. I think he was a E6 or E7 or something like that. He went, one, two, three, four, you're a Marine. Well, thank God I was three because I didn't want to be a Marine. And then they give you some aptitude tests. And since I had a college education, I scored IQ, I think it was 139 or something on the aptitude test. They said, oh, you've got some intelligence. I said, yeah, I guess. You can go to OCS. And I said, Oh, what does that mean? And I, the guy said, well, you've got a two-year commitment, but if you go to OCS, you only have to extend yourself for 10 more months. And I said, okay, and then what? Well, you go to basic training in AIT, and then you go to officer's candidate school, which is six months, and then you're guaranteed four more months in the States. I said, well, well maybe the Vietnam War will be over by then. Well, it wasn't. So I did my basic and my AIT training, which is advanced infantry training. Went to officer's candidate school. I have a picture of myself here, if anybody's interested. It's a little, it's a little different. They tried to break you. I don't know what they do today, but back then they tried to break you. They wanted, especially in officer's candidate school. We started out with a 256 students and we graduated 112. Everybody else quit. That's more than half the class quit. Because they figured if you can't make it through officer's candidate school, then you're not going to make it through a combat situation being under pressure. And so they put a lot of pressure on you in those six months. The system is designed to place the candidate under physical, mental, and emotional stress to simulate, as closely as possible, the stress and fatigue of combat. Only in this way can the candidate receive an evaluation as to his ability to work and react under such pressure. Now as you progress through the school, became, when you came, became a senior candidate, then anybody <laughs> below you, like an intermediate or a basic candidate, then you could put the pressure on them. I got people, I'm not a really bad person, but I had people quit because I was so mean. Because I'd been through 18 weeks of people being pretty mean to me but I, and I feel bad about that today but that's what we were instructed to do but graduated from officers candidate school as a second lieutenant spent four months at Fort Carson where I met my current wife or only wife I've ever had and then was sent to Vietnam as an infantry platoon leader second lieutenant McDonald was supposed to go to Panama for training in an environment similar to Vietnam However, the Army confused his orders, and McDonald was given the decision between doing the training session in Panama and going straight to Vietnam, or going to see his family for two weeks before Vietnam and skipping Panama entirely. He chose the latter. McDonald took his girlfriend, Betty, to meet his parents in Rockford, Illinois, before he shipped out. His goodbyes to both Betty and his parents were emotional. I didn't think I was coming back. I sold my car which was a 66 Pontiac, which I wish I had today. I sold it for 800 bucks. I put the money in the bank and put it under my wife's name. She wasn't my wife at the time. And I said, if I don't come back, the money's yours. If I come back, 
We'll buy it. <clears throat> Excuse me. We'll buy an engagement ring. Having said his goodbyes, McDonald boarded an airplane. He was headed for Vietnam. I landed in Benoit Air Base. They filed us all into a big room and there was a sergeant there. It was like an orientation and he said, are there any second lieutenant infantries? And then about six or seven of us raised our hand like this. You've got a six minute life expectancy. So I figured, heck, I've been there for seven or eight minutes. I've already beat the odds. But that's what they told us. So we had three days of in-country training. It was pretty, wasn't too bad, you know, you learned stuff and did some, I don't remember a whole lot about it, but I do remember some in-country training. And then we were assigned to a unit and, and uh, I was assigned to A Company, 5th Battalion, 7th Cavalry, 1st Air Cavalry Division. And then they just sent me out there. I don't know where I was, Central Highlands someplace. Somewhere about 10 miles from the Cambodian border, that's what they told us. We may have been in Cambodia for all I know. The first CAV looked for trouble. We walked trails. We didn't hack our way through the jungle, which is a lot safer. We walked the trails because that's where the enemy was. We were the most decorated unit in Vietnam. First Cavalry was. Soldiers in the First Cav executed a large variety of missions in Vietnam, such as search and destroy missions, rescue missions, and bomb damage assessments. These were everyday occurrences, but each was fraught with danger. The major actions of our combat troops consist of search and destroy operations. Intensive drives through enemy territory with the primary objective of finding and destroying his forces and then moving on. Bomb damage assessments were another type of first cab mission. Commonly referred to as BDAs, bomb damage assessments functioned to inform military leadership of how much damage bombings had done. Foot soldiers gathered knowledge such as the number of casualties. BDAs were important, but they could be just as dangerous as a search and destroy mission. Because damage assessment squads were the first Americans on the scene after the bombing, they had no knowledge of the surviving enemy, and ambushes could be staged by the NVA or VC to kill the American troops assessing damage. Every day we just looked for trouble. I mean, uh, we were the first cab, we were an infantry unit, and that's what we were doing. Or we were assigned to, like I say, a bomb damage assessment, or we had to, I hate to say this, but I'll say it. We had a battalion commander that had a big board, and he kept track of how many enemy we killed. We'd have to report it every day. There were two types of reports. There was an estimated, and then we had step-ons, and I know you know what a step-on would be. That would be the ones that we could step on and know they were really dead. Kind of sick, really, but this was his deal, and he kept a tally, and the company that did the best, I don't know, we got a reward, I guess. I don't remember that part. I remember one day, this goofy battalion commander we had, and I don't remember his name, the guy that kept the tally. <laughs> he sent my, my platoon out to look for two Viet Cong that he claimed he had shot from his helicopter at 100 yard, or 1,000 yards in the air with a 45 pistol. You can't even hit anything from here to there with a 45 pistol. But he sent us out there and we spent the entire day looking for these two bodies so he could put it on his tally sheet. Pretty sad. But that's what we did. Every day was kind of different. We spent time on the fire base. So I was on the LZ buttons and the uh, fire base buttons. When we were on the fire base, they were shooting uh, 105s and, and 120s constantly, artillery, because artillery, you know, they'd get calls to fire here or fire there or whatever. So it was pretty noisy. And plus you got 50 caliber machine guns going off all the time had um, RPGs, which are rocket-propelled grenades, and mortars shot into our, our LZ, and 
LZ buttons nightly. Uh, we had the wire breached once, which is Constantino wire like they have in prisons and stuff. But we repelled that attack because they never stayed. They didn't want to fight you because they, they couldn't, f they didn't have the wherewithal to stage any kind of a major battle, except for Tet, but I was there after Tet. The VC and the NVA, they like to attack you either in the early morning, when you were still kind of like half asleep, like just before sunrise, or just after the sun went down. In, in the evening, we'd set out Claymore mines around our perimeter if we were in the field. And we'd always have, like, a, somebody would change for guard duty in case you heard something. But if you heard anything, you just set the mine off because you didn't know what was out there. It was going to be a wild pig or it could be the enemy. It was hectic, you know. But you had to live with it. I mean, you were there. You, you got to serve. Basically, they just wanted to wound or kill as many as they could in the shortest period of time, and then they would disperse and go, and you could never find them, you know, unless you ran into them on a trail. That's why we walk trails. I had two gentlemen, two young boys, young men, in my platoon in Vietnam. Um, both of them from, from the south. One was from Alabama, the other one was from West Virginia. They had no fear. They were in the Army for three years. The reason they were there is because they were moonshiners. And the judge said, five years in jail or three years in the service, and they both chose the service, which was probably a good choice for them. The guy from Alabama would walk point almost every day. He'd volunteer to walk point, which was the most dangerous job in the Army or in the, in the platoon because you're out there 100 yards in front of everybody else with only one guy backing you up and you're the one that's going to be shot at first. He was like 19, his name was John, and I can't remember his last name, but we called him Alabama. He won a Silver Star over there at 19 years old. Alabama would walk the trail. West Virginia would back him up. They were great buddies because I told you why they were there. West Virginia carried an M79 grenade launcher, which is a propelled type of grenade. Alabama carried a sawed-off 12-gauge shotgun loaded with double-out buck because you don't have to aim that, you just have to point it. And it's a lot easier than an M16, which I carried. I was supposed to carry a 45 pistol, but that's a piece that's worthless. Can't hit anything from here to the wall. M16 were loaded with 20 round clips. You never fired it on automatic because they jammed. They were poorly made. I don't know if they were poorly made. They were not jungle weapons. They were not like an AK-47, which was made by the Russians, which is what the NVA and the VC had. Uh, so we already fired it on semi-automatic because if you fired it on automatic, it would jam and then that would be no good. The AKs had a 30 round clip. We had a 20 round clip, so we were already 10 rounds short already. So we would take three clips and put duct tape like this and like this so you had 60 rounds instead of only 30 or 20 rounds. Because you could put one in and then flip it and then to like this. So you could, little, that was like field expediency, you know. Everybody carried C4, which is an explosive to blow up stuff, like tunnels if we found any, because they had a lot of tunnels over there. But if you just light C4 and don't have blasting cap, you can heat your C rations with them. Because you heat your coffee, because it burns. It burns like sterno. But if you hit it with a shock, then it explodes like dynamite. I, there, there's a lot of things that went on. I mean, the one that sticks in my mind most is the day I was wounded, though.
The day we were hit, or the day we, I was wounded, October 20th, 1969, I'll never forget that day, we were sent out a couple days prior to do a BDA, which is a bomb damage assessment. When they're dropping 1,000 pound bombs from B-52 airplanes, about 300,000 or 30,000 or 50,000 feet up in the air, they don't figure out what's happening. So then they would send an infantry company in to do a BDA. So we were on a BDA. We had, the second day we had killed a forward observer for a North Vietnamese mortar company. We sent his papers and his pictures of his family and whatever that he had back to S4, which is intelligence in the Army. And they told us who he was. We knew they were in the area. You never saw them. Your triple canopy jungle, you don't see much of anything, except if you're on the trail. We were then, then told to cut ourselves a pickup zone or a PZ. So our company commander decided the best way to cut out part of the jungle is to call in chainsaws. And so we had chainsaws brought in by helicopter. Spent about 20 plus hours sawing down enough of the jungle, bamboo jungle, to get two helicopters in. When we were done with that, I had already told the company commander that I would request a transfer because it was the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. You don't stay in the same place in Vietnam for 20 plus hours because they know where you are. As soon as the first helicopters hit the ground, the mortars followed them in. We had 27 wounded and nine killed that afternoon within a half an hour. I would probably be dead today if there wasn't a young man, and I can't remember his name, he was a forward observer, but he was a sergeant. He was from about me to you, Caitlin, when the mortar round went off, and he took about 90% of the round, and I got the rest of it. He took maybe 95% of the round. If he wasn't there, I would have taken the round. He'd been there 11 months. He had 29 days to go. He would have gone home, but he was killed instantly. If he wasn't there, then I would have gone, but I'd only been there 35 days. So I guess somebody was looking out for me, and so that's what happens. The Viet Cong and the NVA did not stick around because we had too much firepower, because we called in artillery, we called in the Air Force, we called in the, the uh, Cobra gunships, and within a half an hour, they had dispersed. I mean, they're gone, but they did what they wanted to do. They killed some Americans and they wounded a bunch of other ones. They, the Chinook helicopter came in and since I was one of the least wounded, they put me on the, the helicopter with the nine body bags, which wasn't pleasant. That afternoon, they took me to Quan Loy, which was like a mash unit. You guys seen mash on TV? Well, it's a kind of a mash unit. It was like a, you know, a hospital in the middle of a war zone. And they did some doctoring there. They gave me some codeine for the pain and whatever. And then they stick me on a medevac chopper. And in the on the way to Benoit or uh, Long Bin Military Hospital. They got a call that this other unit, I don't remember the unit, was in a firefight. And this kid, had he was walking point, and the guy behind him was walking back up with the M79. And it went off because he got nervous, and the, the thing lodged in the calf of his leg. Well, the thing was still armed. See, it couldn't go, it has to go 20 yards before it arms itself and then it, when it hits the ground it explodes. So it was in his leg, still active, but it wasn't, hadn't gone the distance twirling to arm itself. So they put this guy on the helicopter with me with this thing in his leg. 
And I'm saying, man, what if that sucker goes off? <laughs> I got in real trouble. Cause I, you know, but he, was, he had this thing in his calf of his leg, and they took us down to the hospital on the medevac chopper and didn't go off, thank goodness. I was taken to a hospital in Long Bend. Um, the doctor that operated on me was a was a major, but he was drafted. He was he had gone through medical school and had service, and he operated on it about 12 hours. He operated on my leg, took as many pieces. I still have shrapnel on my leg because he can't get all the pieces out because they're little pieces. He took as much out as he could. He came around the next morning about seven o'clock. He said, move your foot. And I said, my brain's telling my foot to move, but it's not moving. He said, oh, you got one of those one in a million wounds. And I said, what does that mean? He said, you get to go home. I said, wow, that's nice. You had to be wounded three times in Vietnam before you could go home, if it was a superficial wound. Like you just shot through the shoulder or said something that wasn't major, like nerve damage that I had. You had to be wounded three times They'd send you to Cameron Bay after they patched you up for 30 days and you'd be back in the field again. I don't know if people ever knew that. I mean, I knew that and, and probably back here, people never knew that. We didn't call it home, we called it the world. We go back to the world. Um, and guys would count it down. You got X amount of days plus a wake up and then you get go back to the world. You had 21 days in a wake up or 99 days in a wake up or whatever. So anyway, he came by the next morning, said, move your foot. I can't move my foot. He said, you got a one in a million wound. You get to go home. I said, great. Spent five more days in the hospital. They don't sew your wounds up in the hospital in Vietnam. They leave them open because of so much disease and infection, and they don't want to get infected because if they sew it up and it gets infected, then they got to open it up again. After five days, they sent me to Okinawa to a hospital. They sewed my wounds up in Okinawa with steel um, because in that because it doesn't dissolve and it kept them stronger. I spent two weeks in Okinawa, and I spent. They sent me to Fitzsimmons Hospital in Denver because I lied to them because I said I lived in Colorado instead of Illinois, and they couldn't. And my records they didn't figure it out, and because I knew my wife lived in Colorado Springs, which is about 50 miles away, so she could come and see me. She knew I was coming back, um, and she was, I think she, I, they, they put me, I got to the hospital, I think, early evening or something, so she didn't come till the next day, but, but I had communicated with her. She wasn't my wife at the time. In fact, we weren't even engaged because we hadn't got the money out of the bank that I sold my car, but we got the ring in like November, and I came back like the end of October, so. I carried a picture with me all the time when I was there. I showed it to people. It was, I mean, I was in love with her. I still am in love with her. She's my best friend. After a few months of recovery in the hospital, Skip McDonald was assigned to Fort Benjamin Harrison in Indianapolis, Indiana, the site of the U.S. Army Finance Center. Before heading there, though, McDonald received a three-day pass so that he could marry the love of his life Betty. They became husband and wife on March 14, 1970. After three short days of marriage and honeymoon, McDonald headed to Fort Harrison for his assignment. I was a company commander at that time, and I was actually a executive officer for the headquarters company for several months, and then they made me a company commander of a student company, which was great duty because these guys all went to class, you know, to learn finance, and I just had to have roll call in the morning, and then at four o'clock they were out of class, and then I'd have to make sure they were all there, and then I get to go home again. That's pretty nice, but that was different than being in Vietnam. Certainly wasn't going out and looking for trouble and shooting at people. A couple times I had to go notify some, since I was an officer, I had to notify some families that their son had been killed in Vietnam. I did that twice. That's not fun. Pretty sad. When I 
my time was up, my two years and 10 months was up, I called the Department of the Army because after your stint is up, if you re-up for another year, I was a first lieutenant at the time, you make captain automatically. I called the Department of the Army and I said, what are you gonna do with me if I extend for another year? And they said, you have a 90% chance of going back to Vietnam and 10% chance of going to Korea. I said the odds aren't right, so I was done. McDonald was involved in more than 20 firefights in his 35 days in Vietnam. He received the Combat Infantryman's Badge, and he was also awarded the Purple Heart for the wounds he received on October 20th, 1969. After leaving Fort Harrison in February of 1971, McDonald moved back home to Rockford, Illinois with his wife Betty. There, he began working for his father at the Brearley Company as a customer service manager. He slowly worked his way up in the company and later moved on to buy his own company, Magnified Promotions, which he owned from 1988 to 2006. McDonald is proud of his business accomplishments, but he is even more proud of his marriage and his family. In 1976, Skip and Betty McDonald adopted two of their nieces, Micha and Okcha, from Korea after Betty's sister, the mother of Micha and Okcha, passed away. Skip and Betty worked hard to build a strong relationship and a good life for both of their children. They have been happily married for 46 years. McDonald believes their deep commitment is the result of the strong family values he gained from his parents, beliefs in loyalty and commitment that were strengthened by his loyalty to his country and his men in Vietnam. McDonald also maintains close relationships with his siblings, and he hopes that he and Betty have been able to pass on their strong family values to their children as well. Working with Mr. McDonald's story has been transformational in my life over the past year. Uh, turning it into a documentary has been uh, very impactful and I've taken away a lot of lessons from it. Uh, namely, I've learned a lot about loyalty and a lot about leadership and a lot about sacrifice through the events of Mr. McDonald's life. Learning about Mr. McDonald's time in Vietnam uh, really showed me a lot about the sacrifices that veterans have made throughout our country's history in every war that we've had, the Revolutionary War, uh, World War II, the Civil War, all the way back. I really, I really think that's something that can't be replaced and is pretty hard to learn. And I think that thanks to Mr. McDonald being willing to share his story, uh, will be, has been a lot easier for me and will be a lot easier for a lot of other people who have been able to watch this documentary. Mr. McDonald made a huge sacrifice in going to Vietnam. Even though he didn't necessarily agree with the war, he went over it and he didn't even think that he would, be, he would be coming back, but he knew that he owed it to his country, to his family, and to his community to serve America and do his best as a soldier in Vietnam. And I think that's really taught me a lot about loyalty, as he, he showed so much loyalty to his country and to his family. 
And it's also showed me a lot about uh, perseverance and basically just the will and the grit to get the job done. And I think that that's something that everyone can take away from McDonald's story. And I would like to thank him for being willing to share his story with me and with the Harlem Veteran Project. And I hope that everyone who sees this documentary will be able to take away some of the lessons that I've taken away in making it.